Thank you, Manish. Okay, so today is the sixth module of the uh, series of a correspondent banking webinar for ADB. And um, today's session is on anti-bribery and corruption. So this is one of the major component as well of um, the requirement as far as uh, correspondent banking due diligence is concerned. So as usual, uh, please mute your microphones when not speaking and have your mobile phone handy for to scan the QR code for your parking lot. Uh, use please use the group chat if you want to comment or ask questions as well. Or uh, you can raise your hand if you have any questions and unmute yourself. Um, there is a parking lot. Um, for you to uh, ask questions, uh, that we can use for the next session. And then, uh, uh, basically what we want to do is also to co-create the content with you if you have any particular areas that, if you have any particular areas that you want to um, uh, specifically highlight uh, or what do you, uh, what I say is that is particularly to highlight um, or want to have further emphasis on and uh, Okay, uh, and then also, let's see, uh, Manish, is it possible to enable, I understand that the chat function is not working. Is there any possibility to activate the chat, fun chat function for the participants? Then, well, well, most importantly, is that we have fun uh, having uh, attending this webinar. Okay, so uh, to start, to begin, um, as, as usual, uh, if you have any uh, burning question, let's put it in the parking lot uh, that we can address in... Uh, uh, for future. Let's see if uh, you guys can uh, make use of the uh, webinar chat. And this is the parking lot. So if you have any questions that you would want to be addressed in the next in the next uh, session, please let me know. Um, it is going to be live until the 19th of April. So that way, um, whatever questions that you have, we can actually uh, talk about it uh, in the next session. So the next one is actually our last session. And so your last chance to ask questions or the last chance to uh, highlight any particular area that you would want to address uh, at the webinar. So, I've uh, actually I uh, just realized that uh, I have uh, muted every all the participants. So I'm uh, I have clicked to allow participants to unmute themselves. I hope this works. So, thanks. As I mentioned, uh, this is our module six, and it's on anti-bribery and corruption, a pretty serious topic as we would see it. A recap, and uh, we last week we talked about the importance of transaction monitoring. It's about the key control. It's really very much the key control in any fin financial institutions too. Um, and 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 basically when the customer due diligence or at onboarding is not able to identify any risk areas or concerns. Uh, transaction monitoring is 
uh, monitoring the behavior of the customer's uh, transactions uh, would be able to hopefully detect any uh, suspicious activities. So basically the process chain of, for transaction monitoring cons consists of from the beginning, risk assessment, the due diligence, the risk assessment of high, medium, or low risk of a customer, then we do a proper due diligence uh, on the customer. We determine how much of uh, due diligence is required, whether or not there's a requirement to enhance. And then we uh, put in the parameters, the threshold, and uh, do the scenario setting. What kind of uh, transactions that would require us to investigate further? For example, would it be a high, high, value, high volume, or many to one, one to many. These are some of the uh, scenarios that we put together. And then we have, uh, then uh, we will have got to continue to calibrate to back test and data integrity is important. Uh, we need to, there, on, on top of that, uh, on transaction monitoring, there is a pre-transaction checking, typically, uh, you know, to prevent uh, it's more to prevent the transaction from going through be rather than to uh, have it uh, checked at the, uh, after the transaction has gone through. That pre-transaction is uh, for, for more for sc uh, screening for sanctions and now also for fraud. Um, how do we handle the alerts that come in? Uh, that requires a lot of training of the staff as well, how we document and then we, uh, we do the investigation and the filing. So some of those examples, we also discussed last week, some of the transactions are uh, the, the scenarios for monitoring of transactions. And we discussed also um, a scenario where there is um, uh, online sexual exploitation of children. How do we actually identify or, or rather what kind of scenarios we will put into the system for that purpose? So a quote to remember from Eric Favilla is when the payment stops, so will the abuse. So effective transaction monitoring system is where it will contain a well-calibrated framework, robust risk awareness, uh, meaningful integration and uh, active oversight. And uh, we also discussed last week about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, what artificial AI and ML, as we call it, would be good for, and the considerations when we use or rely on AI ML. It's not just like put the system in and then that's it, uh, because we need to uh, consider also uh, data quality, the integrity of the data, and then the data privacy, explainability of artificial intelligence, and also the ongoing monitoring and validation of the AI models. Because uh, we, we again, this is an area where we cannot just uh, implement the system and then not uh, not allowing it to, uh, not, not calibrate, not assessing its uh, effectiveness and accuracy over a period of time. And it's a continuous process. So on front and scam, uh, another quote from Jackie Chang, Cheng, uh, Gaza uh, director of board and Google Look Chair is that unity. For us, unity is very important. Uh, all of us must work together to combat fraud, and it's not just any particular department. And if at all anything that we should remember from the last session is that compliance does not stop financial crime. People do. All of us would have got to work together to stop financial crime. Not any particular department, not risk, not compliance, not finance, but all of us together. And so um, from the last parking lot, we had, um, we had two questions that came in. First is actually uh, a, con a, a comment that came that says, finding efficient and effective ways to perform compliance wanting to see if this can be a customer drive process to facilitate KYC, KYB process, particularly if the resources are small for startup companies. So I here's my answer to this. I hope the person who asked that question uh, is here uh, because 
uh, what I would like to um, highlight is that there's these are some of the considerations um, on finding efficient and effective ways to perform compliance. Some considerations, um, this, this is a slide that we have gone through uh, in module two, which is on customer due diligence, the end-to-end -end process, the key element of customer due diligence. And uh, you, we will see that uh, who are the people that we do due diligence on. So I, I think that uh, when it comes to KYC, KYB, right, a lot of times people look at KYC or KYB to be, um, to be different from customer due diligence. KYC or KYB, as we term it, used to be an old term that was used way back in the 90s when um, when this concept first came in. So in, in, in essence, KYC or KYB is no different from customer due diligence. Um, possibly here, uh, the, this person who asked the question is thinking about KYC or KYB is at the onboarding part of it while the due diligence is actually a more holistic, it's the entire thing. So, okay, so to give an answer to KYC and KYB is they are actually not different. How um, some people have actually looked at it is that KYC is the what, due diligence is the how. So, okay, first, some considerations when doing due, customer due diligence, I'll say, is that um, we need to see whether you are operating in a business to business model b2b business to uh customers or consumers b2c or even you know as complicated as a b2b to c right we also need to look at the delivery channel what kind of delivery channel is that uh is it an online uh, uh as uh, i assume that this is a startup and likelihood that this is a fintech uh online delivery, is it uh, going to be uh, EKYC? Um, the other consideration is that, is there national ID, any part of the population that doesn't have one? Is it physical? Is there digital identity um, platform in the jurisdiction that you are doing the customer due diligence? And uh, how far can we automate? What kind of budget? What kind of volume? One other thing that uh, need to be considered as well is on continuous monitoring that it is not a one-off process. So implementation is key. So um, happy to discuss further on this area if uh, anyone is uh, is is keen to know more. Um, you can contact me or you can actually reach out to the ADB team if you feel that uh, you need to have further discussion on this area because um, it is uh. It is, it is uh, more on the implementation as well. Understandable, I mean, I, I can really understand where uh, resources are small uh, or whether you are in a startup, but there are a lot of other considerations in it as well. And I think that especially for banks uh, where we are onboarding a corporate customers that come into our um, a business that is coming into the bank uh, as a customer, uh, the bank would definitely give consideration on what kind of customer due diligence process that um, this business has. Um, yes, it's a small, uh, it's a small customer, or, or rather, it's a startup with a very, uh, very, very little resource. But on the other hand, what can we do about it? And I think uh, one of, of, of course, when it comes to um, whether or not the customer can self-service, uh, by all means, I think there are a lot of uh, automated solutions out there. As I mentioned earlier, it's about eKYC, a customer actually putting in uh, on the app, uh, take a picture uh, of themselves, take a picture of the ID, or making use of the digital ID platform from the, custom, uh, from the government. Uh, there could be all these other uh, user-friendly forms, uh, online portal as well. So basically, there are a lot of all these elements to be considered. Uh, so the question I would say is rather general. So if anyone wants to reach out to understand more about implementation, uh, feel free to do so. So far, so good. So... Right.
And the next question, uh, the next comment is a uh, question is that is risk-based CDD important only for international transactions or for every customer and transaction? So I think uh, here would like to um discuss a bit more about the risk-based approach. So the risk-based approach is essential not only for international transactions and for but for every customer, regardless of their nature and or origin and why is that so? Now, risk-based CDD is actually a fundamental principle that applies to all customers and transactions, regardless whether they are domestic or international or cross-border, as we also term it as. The goal of the risk-based is really very much to assess the level of risk associated. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Right. This is uh, also uh, something that we discussed in module two, uh, which is on the customer risk assessment. So risk-based customer risk assessment is where we are talking um, because not all customers or transactions pose the same level of risk. By adopting a risk-based approach, uh, we can allocate resources more effectively by focusing our efforts or, or risk management efforts on higher risk relationships and applying a lighter touch measure to the lower risk ones. So when it comes to customer risk assessment, uh, here are the factors that we need to look at. Client risk, uh, what kind of customer it is, whether or not it's individual, corporate, uh, sovereign wealth fund, or, or, you know, um, or, you know, and then we need to verify the source of wealth and source of funds. The regulation status, whether it's a regulated entity or, or, or business, or it is not a regulated business. Um, and years in operation does play a part in it. Uh, that it is not a company that um, is set up for a for nefarious reasons. So we talk. We look at the industry risk. There are some of the industry type that may be um more uh at risk that, or, or uh, risky in from an and from a money laundering perspective. Uh, say for example, uh, the trading in uh precious metal and precious stones. So these are some of the areas, or, or another one is a cash-rich business. So these are some of the industries that may pose a higher risk, so so on and so forth. So these are these, these were areas of, that we would consider when we do a risk assessment of a customer to decide or determine whether a customer requires further or enhanced due diligence, um, or they will, uh, we can apply a lower, uh, lighter touch on them. So it also depends on the jurisdiction, the delivery channel, as well as the product. So for example, a product being offered by the bank, being a correspondent banking relationship will typically be identified as a higher risk product and therefore enhanced due diligence on the counterparty uh, would happen and will be required. So. Learning objective of this book, today's module is uh, first to uh, to talk about the bribery and corruption, uh, the definition of it and some of the relevant references, uh, the impact of uh, bribery and corruption, uh, some examples and what's in the news, and also the implementation, some of the challenges. I, I would say that uh, when it comes to uh, implementation of uh, any uh, anti-bribery and corruption um, Policies and procedures can be pretty challenging. Um, uh, not exactly my favorite uh, area, uh, but it is very crucial to an organization. So corruption. So what? How do we define corruption? Transparency International defines corruption as exposing uh and holding the corruption the corrupt account can only happen if we understand the way corruption works and the systems that enable it. So exposing corruption itself is very, very important. And it is not an area where um, it is easy to identify as well. Um, that's why you know our customer due diligence and our PEP assessment is important. PEP would be uh, politically exposed persons. Some of the global references. So Transparency International, I would say, is the global standard um, for uh, on, on corruption matters. And we have OECD that has also set up a working group on bribery. In, I think there's some news uh, recently on from the OECD as well. So uh, the two laws that are very um, 
that are extraterritorial, I'll say it's uh, it would be the USA Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, uh, which covers all US citizens, US persons uh, that bribe uh, foreign officials, but also foreign nationals. The, the, the interesting thing about the S FCPA is that it is about the intent rather than whether the act has happened. While in the UK Bribery Act, which is also extraterritorial, which covers, um, sorry, uh, typo is uh, it covers the the any of the um entities or perps persons who are to have nexus to the UK, and this actually is only covering those the act that has happened. So uh, I'm gonna change the slide. Okay, so uh, FATF is uh, has something very interesting, and this is where um I feel that uh it's worth uh highlighting is uh the transparency. So FATF has two recommendations that focus on transparency. And then uh FATF has actually also touched on uh the misuse of citizenship and residency by investment programs. So uh, T. Raja Kumar, the uh, current uh, FATF president, he actually highlighted that granting citizenship and residency to wealthy investors through the Golden Passport and Visa program uh, can potentially lead to economic growth, but they also can be exploited. And so FATF in November uh, issued a guideline uh, on the misuse of citizenship and residency by investment programs. So it's a CBI and RBI. So um, let us go back to our previous uh, modules as well, where we have hi uh, we discussed uh, the uh, now three billion Sing dollars uh, money laundering rate that happened in August last year, and there were ten people who were arrested. So far, three have uh, two have been uh, sentenced and one uh, should be sentenced very soon so look at these people they were originally from china and then one holds a cambodian passport another one holds cyprus as well as a vanuatu passport and the third one holds a vanuatu passport and we can see that you know when it comes to um when it comes to making use of identification, the opportunity to acquire a travel and identification document that is under a different nationality. So it, it in a way it obfuscates the person's original identity. And so and okay, the last one is Joe Lau, famous for his uh, uh involvement in the one MDB, originally from Malaysia, held St. Kitts and Nevis and a Cyprus passport. And um, those passports have since been revoked. And you can see that Joe Lau is a very famous uh, fugitive, and I believe uh, most people would have heard of him. And, and you can see that um, how, if say, for example, uh, yeah, we, we talk about uh, Su and Chang during the, our CD, uh, Module 2 uh, Customer Due Diligence uh, webinar, is that if you were to see this guy walking in, to your branch and then he comes with a Cambodian passport. Now, this guy has already been blacklisted by the Chinese government for illegal gambling, for operating illegal gambling. So, and you would not, even if the transit or, or the name screening has uh, has uh, identified a name match, would we have cancelled that off to say that it's a false match? Because, you know, that person that was blacklisted was a Chinese, while this person who walks into a branch held a Cambodian passport. So that's where we, uh, you know, that's a challenge when it comes to um, having a different identification document. So it, it, the original identity has been obfuscated. So uh, today, as I mentioned, we are going to talk about anti-bribery, corruption, and conflict of interest. I think conflict of interest also fall into this uh, realm. Bribery, the definition of bribery is by Transparency International, the offering and promising, giving, accepting, or soliciting 
of an advantage to induce an action uh, which is illegal, unethical, and a breach of trust. It's basically to talk about, you know, taking a having this uh it could be a key controller of an organization government officials and uh, someone who is in the position of power or position to influence any uh any form of decision that would uh, disadvantage another party so it could be anything of value in, in fact you know it's uh, now been defined that even hospitali uh, hospitality uh say for example um giving out for f1 tickets uh, or you know, go, going for uh, official trips, uh, sponsoring official trips. These are also considered as anything of value. So some of the very typical uh, example I think would be also kickbacks, uh, illegal payment made to or accepted by individual or organization is in exchange for business uh, favor or advantages. Uh, this is pretty common uh we have uh we have seen quite a lot of that and and a lot of uh, all these are in the news so and then you have facilitation payment um these are very very much uh small and unofficial payments made to public official or any um other uh individuals to secure or expedite routine government action and usually this what we meant by small and unofficial payment is that um it would not have a receipt. So say, for example, you walk up to a particular um, uh, government um, counter, or say, for example, to uh, apply for a passport, and the, the officer tells you that, oh, okay, so you need to pay me a fee of $300, and here's the receipt for it. So that one is the official one. And um, the, if, you want, if you want it urgent, uh, I will need you to pay $500, um, as an unofficial payment for me to expedite it. So in some uh, jurisdictions, facilitation payment has been a norm. And so during the time when we were uh, implementing the UK Bribery Act in 2010, I believe, uh, this was an area of concern because when we did a when, when we did a gap analysis country by country was when we realized that um, Facilitation payment was very much a standard practice, uh, although it, it was a culture more so in some jurisdiction. And so um, generally very, very difficult to identify and to stop. And um, and especially where for uh, businesses that have nexus to the UK Bribery Act, uh, this, this became a very... Uh, deep concern and so um, a, a lot of times where uh, if any of these uh, facilitation payment were identified you know, there had to be escalation to the compliance as well as to the senior management on how to deal with it and given that it is a zero tolerance um, this would be declined and and basically in, in a lot of the banks um, it would be a uh, declining uh, to make such payments and then to uh, just go on the normal route. I, I don't know if any of you guys have actually experienced this uh, in your jurisdiction or in the work that you do. Has anyone actually uh, experienced any of such? Can can you uh can you type into the chat to see whether you can, or uh, you are unable to do so? Can can you can anyone type into the chat? Yay! Okay, it works. Thanks, David. Because uh, it, it was pretty quiet, so I was wondering whether it's working. Thank you. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, government offices, especially in procurement. So, they, which is why one of the areas, as uh, Chinyap mentioned, uh, it, especially in pro procurement, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, all these. Uh, especially, I, I think that uh, this is quite common uh, in our region, or I know in Asia, uh, where I came from, uh, this has been a 
pretty big issue. Um, and in Malaysia, there is a there is this NGO that was set up called C4, the long name um, that is in the, in the business of fight, fighting corruption together with the agency. Okay, so corruption, uh, Transparency International uh, defines corruption to be the abuse of entrusted power. So the cause of corruption, political freedom and the rule of law, the freedom uh, in, and there is a mistrust all in the government. Environmental, our chance for a healthy environment and sustainable future. And uh, this is quite common, especially in the um, when we are referring to the green uh, economy, uh, we are talking about ESG. Uh, there is a lot of concerns there as well, and uh, economical. And here in the right hand side, you see a picture of the Highland Tower. This was uh, quite some time ago, where um, what happened was, you know, th this was actually a high rise uh, condominium, uh, really a high end condominium in uh, Kuala Lumpur, and um, it was a uh, certified to be a uh, to to be. Uh, good for for occupation, oh. and so what happened was you know there was under uh, under uh, underground river that was not uh, reported, and so over time it eroded, and there was a landslide, and the entire um, set of condominium actually collapsed, and the, this this is one of them, and I think um and also, of course this is quite difficult to also um prove. And it's just like there were a lot of uh, issues um, during, there was a lot of uh, reports actually uh, after the uh, earthquake in uh, Turkey and Syria that highlighted that had the buildings been built better uh, with better quality material, if not for corruption, there would not have been so many casualties in Syria and uh, Turkey because um, and, and this was because, you know, uh, there was so much of corruption that the materials that were used for the construction were inferior. So that that was, uh, that were all in the report, but so far, I think uh, it was a lot of allegations. Uh, so no one has been charged on that. It is rather difficult to prove on hindsight. So, and the other one is on conflict of interest. So. This is where we have this question of uh, I need to discharge on professional duties and on the other hand, I need to satisfy my own interests. So there's always this decision making or actions related to the company. Is it for the company or is it for self? And we will we will also discuss, you know, the kind of uh, policies and procedures that are put in place typically in any organization on that, um, not just for company but also to protect the staff uh yeah so this is an example uh, of news uh so this uh, mp that moved to a new role in grab in singapore uh because of conflict of interest uh concerns over the public affairs post so she was originally being a po uh, appointed in a post that we was uh, dealing with public affairs and policy work. So then she actually mo was moved to a new role. But uh, she did resign uh, soon after that. I think it's also because, you know, there is a lot of concern as an MP to uh, um, member of parliament to be involved in any of uh, corporate work. And then uh, also this is another case of the, of uh, Blue Crest being fined or for, by, um, by the UK watchdog for staff uh, fund failing. And this is a case with the Central Bank of Angola and correspondent banking. And I, I wanted to share this particular case is because it shows how important it is for us to actually work together and to train our staff. Uh, so this was in 2018, how a teller in a bank branch stopped a 500 million US dollar bank heist. So. Um, I have actually put the link into the reference so that you can, if you're interested in the case, you can, you can look into it. Uh, not much of uh, information online, uh, but this is also, okay, this is how it happened. So why I say that it was relating to correspondent bank. So uh, Standard Chartered Bank, 
uh, is a banker of Bank uh, Central Bank of Angola. And so they what they saw was a swift message that came in, which is the MT202. And MT202 uh, is the message type for a for an interbank transfer. A being be interbank transfer, which uh, says that uh, I am uh, doing a bank to bank transfer of funds. It, it, it is very uh, common for MT202 between banks because you know you have the money market and all the settlement that happens. So it, it looks quite normal from a person's point of view is that um, that uh, it is actually a bank to bank transfer and it wasn't identified that there could be something suspicious about it. Now, I think uh, what was actually missed out was that the end um, recipient was a corporate entity called uh, Perfect Fit. And then um, this was the, the MT202 was to HSBC and then it onward, it went onward into Perfect Fit, which was identified by HSBC. And um, on uh, a, a subsequent report was that uh, HSBC has actually filed a suspicious activity report. Uh, it could be, uh, but that, that was uh, a, a subsequent report that we saw um, because uh, when the money went into the corporate company of uh, 500 million, nobody actually um, realized that there could be a suspicious uh, activity in that. How the bank teller has looked, has uh, identified it, how the bank has identified it is that uh, the teller, uh, the, someone came to the bank uh, branch to withdraw funds from a Fed account. And the bank teller noticed that there was a $5 million, $500 million sitting in, in the account. And so she immediately uh, highlighted to uh, she immediately declined the, the withdrawal to the person and and reported to her manager about it and the HSBC immediately stopped uh, blocked the account for further investigation and so during that time uh, apparently there was um there there was also a, a situation where um when there was inquiry being made or request for information being done. There were some fictitious documents that were produced uh, purportedly from Credit Suisse Bank. So, so this was a very elaborate scheme of, um, of uh, and, and very well engineered as well. That's why it could have gone through if not because of this particular staff at the branch who noticed that this did not make sense. So... And so you can see uh, how, uh, you know, having a good understanding of the environment, uh, the correspondent banking does play an important role. So because uh, central, well, a lot of banks would have relationship with central banks and most of the time, there would not be what we will see as a typical correspondent banking account because the central bank does not have any end customer if there is any transaction between the central bank and the banks, it would be for, for uh, what we will term as a principal to principal. Uh, it would just be for the bank or the central bank itself rather than to be paying to a third party. So there are a couple of central banks around the world that, have, that are quite unique in the sense that they may be uh, doing some form of correspondent banking relationship with a bank, but for a particular agency or agency. So there are some of those and there may there is a central bank. I don't know whether it still happens is that the Central Bank of Lebanon actually uh, maintains banking account for their staff. So these are some of the unique uh, situation where central banks could be a correspondent banking customer, but uh, I would say broadly no. So in the case of Central Bank of Angola, yes, um, they did not have a typical correspondent banking account, and this should have been picked up. And it would see, it would seem that they did produce some documentation which was fictitious, and so it was not identified. And yes, uh, Chin Yap, uh, 
also highlighted that conflict of interest is not necessarily a type of corruption as uh, corruption exists because you know there are three elements as uh, she has also highlighted is that the three elements to exist for corruption is abuse of power of entrusted power and for private gain. So we will see that in quite a few of the other cases that uh, have been highlighted uh, or, or in the news in the recent years. One is, uh, the other one is actually on political, charitable or contributions and uh, sponsorships. So um, this, this is a very challenging one with a political donation. So uh, Najib, uh, the Prime, ex Prime Minister of Malaysia, he should prove that the money in his account was from was a Saudi royal donation, which was given to him for the purpose of election. And then the other one is where uh the ten people who were accused of money laundering last year, at least five of them have uh, made donation to charitable organizations and social service agencies. Um so I think uh, when it comes to charitable organizations, which is where uh, the charitable organizations are therefore uh, quite vulnerable. And for those who are in charitable organizations, uh, you will be familiar with this, is that there are two parts. One is whether or not um, they became the tools for money laundering or they, um, they are receiving funds from uh, uh, bad guys as I would call them, because, you know, charitable organizations, a lot of time, uh, you know, they are fundraising and any any bit of money would count. And now charitable organizations have uh, are required to do due diligence on the source of funds. I think in the past, you know, it was something that was never um, brought to attention is that charitable organizations should do due diligence and owes, uh, are on the source of funds that come to them. And, and in this particular case, the Rainbow Center and uh, the Lions Befrienders, as well as the uh, National Kidney Foundation, they they have actually come out to, uh, to say that uh, they have received money from these individuals that were arrested. There are some other organizations as well that are that were not uh, specifically mentioned. Some notable cases on the, about World Cup and one MDB, Qatar, uh, ahead of World Cup. So, uh, this this became a really huge issue uh, on uh, Qatar because of the uh, of of the gifts uh, ahead of the World Cup, and of course, uh, ex Goldman. Uh, banker getting the 10 years in prison for corruption case. This was on one MDB and it's quite coincidental that Roger Ng was a, an ex-colleague of mine in uh, when I was actually in Deutsche Bank, Malaysia. So, um, so, yep, so he was actually involved in the one MDB scandal in Malaysia. And uh, yeah, so these are some of the notable cases on corruption. And this month, we had a tycoon uh, being uh, sentenced to death in Vietnam for a fraud case involving a bank, uh, one, the biggest uh, commercial bank in Vietnam. So it shows how uh, serious um, Vietnam is taking this uh, corruption and they wanted to uh, stem it. Therefore, you know, actually uh, uh, imposing a death penalty on this billionaire. Uh, in Vietnam, so uh, it's very recent. I've also put in the link into the um reference if anyone is interested to read more about her. So, what do you think? What would be the impact on Qatar in Malaysia? So, uh, the Transparency uh Corruption Perception Index ranking. So, from twenty twenty, it was thirty, and then you see how it has dropped since the World Cup. It has dropped to forty. And Malaysia in 2020, it was 57 and oh, during that, uh, and then it dropped to 62, 61, and then now it's come back to 57. So this is the impact as far as the uh, corruption perception index is concerned. And maybe you can also give, tell me what you think would be the impact on uh, countries that are perceived to be uh, 
more corrupt than others. Any particular thought on what is the other impact where you have uh, adverse news like this? Anyone with any thought on that? Anyone in the chat? Okay, so remember in the customer due diligence, uh, one of the parameter is um, jurisdiction. And the jurisdiction here is very important in uh, assessing of, for our risk-based approach. The higher the risk of a jurisdiction, a country, the higher your risk rating is going to be. And therefore, when it comes to having a, an impact, it does have an impact on the economy of an of, of in a country. And because the cost of doing business will be higher for that particular company that is uh, incorporated or operating in a particular jurisdiction, which is seen or perceived to have a higher uh, risk of corruption. So, and and then uh, now, um, I'm, I'm not sure how many here are aware of Basel on how Basel 1 has evolved to Basel 2 and Basel 3. So in during the Basel 1 time is where customers uh, are all given the same risk rating and therefore they are priced the same. And so during in Basel 2 is where, uh, you know, uh, it starts to be a risk-based approach as well. And so when it comes to the risk-based approach is where a customer would be charged higher um, in terms of uh, the charges as compared to one that has a lower charge, lower risk rating. And, and it's the same with the customer due diligence as well, because conducting customer due diligence is not cheap. Um, there has been, um, I think there has been a survey done a few years ago where it was identified that every customer due diligence, um, the entire value chain will cost between US dollar 3,000 to 5,000. And that was probably about five years ago. So we are talking about the entire value chain all the way from the person who is making, uh, who is uh, building the file, the customer due diligence file, all the way to the approval, the review and the approval process. So the higher the risk of a customer, the higher the cost of the due diligence. And um, for customers that are high risk, we would have a risk rating of a high, medium, low. And for lower risk customers, uh, typically the periodic review is every five years or every three years. It depends on the regulations as well as it depends on uh, the risk appetite of the organization. So for example, if you have a low risk customer or a standard risk customer uh, having a due diligence every five years versus a customer that has a due diligence, um, a high risk customer that would attract the due diligence periodic review of every one year. So, and normally for correspondent banking relationships, the cycle is that it would be between medium to high risk. Uh, there are, for correspondent banking, it would normally be medium to high risk. So it could be the medium risk could uh, range from two, three to two years uh, periodic review cycle. And then the high risk is an annual review cycle. And so, you know, imagine that if you have this entire enhanced due diligence process of 5,000 per review cycle, so having a correspondent banking relationship, this is, which is a high risk, classified as high risk, it will require you to spend 5,000 US dollars per review cycle per annum. And so, uh, which is why from a commercial perspective, it is more expensive to maintain a correspondent banking relationship with a high risk uh, uh, financial institution as compared to a medium risk one. And country risk is actually one of the factor that is being uh, assessed when it comes to um, putting in the risk assessment for a particular customer. So that that's where uh, when a when a country is deemed to have a higher risk in terms of TCI TICP TICPI ranking is where you would see that the cost of due diligence actually goes up. Yep. 
So uh, again, uh, where we talk about the third party due diligence, we need to look into what kind of um, due diligence is required, uh, whether or not, you know, uh, what kind of vendor or client it is, um, what kind of uh, industry, what kind of jurisdiction, uh, where the jurisdiction is, uh, the country of incorporation and the country of operation is also very important. So the country of incorporation is typically your, your um, headquarters, but the country of incorporation, could it be a branch, could it be a representative office of a financial institution, for example, and the channels of delivery. Uh, we can't emphasize enough about uh, risk assessment and how we do risk assessment and the factors being involved in risk assessing uh, a customer. So uh, maybe I can stop here and see if anyone has any uh, comments or questions. Any comments or questions so far? So and and this is on the third party due diligence, which we will I, I would also like to cover a little bit more is where we are not just when it comes to bribery and corruption. Hence, we now, I think, in the recent maybe five years or so, um, third party due diligence has become something uh which is uh, I would say, uh, popular. Because, you know, uh, people are starting to recognize that uh, vendor risk management or in some cases um, is being um, termed as is important because we then need to also assess vendors the same way that we assess our customers. Um, then we also, uh, maybe not so much on the source of wealth, the funds, but the regulation status, uh, uh, years in operation, that would be important. So for vendor, I think uh, verifying this, source of wealth, wealth and funds is also in a way important but more from a credit perspective we wanted to make sure that the um the vendor is well capitalized uh, especially when it comes to um service prov providers such as software as a platform banking as a platform you know fintech as a platform uh, so on and so forth and so again here uh, we can say that jurisdiction risk is something that uh, we should be considering as well and what kind of product it is. So from, from the perspective of a, so from a perspective of a correspondent bank is where they will be looking as the respondent bank as a customer. And so the due diligence will, will, will ensue where they will be looking at um, the customer due to uh, the, the customer profile, the risk profile. So on the flip side, for a respondent bank to consider onboarding or making use of a correspondent bank, these are also some of the areas um, we would term them as their vendors. This would be a an area where they would want to also look into. So it's not just about uh, correspondent bank uh, assessing the risk of a respondent bank, but also the other way around is where do you want to make, uh, do you want to uh, use this uh, bank? What is their, what, uh, whether or not I face any risk, you know, uh, having this correspond this bank as my correspondent bank relationship. So it works both ways. It's not just one way, but the other way. We also need to do a vendor risk assessment on them, and um, I think very important. This is also a slide that was from the customer due diligence is actually um on PEP, especially when it comes to uh. PEP, we uh we will also need to look at the enhanced due diligence. So it doesn't it is not very different, I would say, from the perspective of whether we are doing an enhanced due diligence on a vendor or on a customer. So we still need to consider uh the same factors, whether or not they have uh PEPs in there uh because on, on one on on this part um we actually recently had a case uh, that I encountered where this particular uh, 
this particular vendor of ours who is actually a fulfillment agent uh, where they oh they 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 are they are the ones who are actually uh, the fulfillment agent when we have the customers who order cards uh, they are the ones who will be the one to ensure that the cards are packed nicely and sent off to the customers and they were involved in um, in an MS media case of corruption is because you know um, there was corruption uh, at, in in them making a facilitation or kickback actually it was a kickback mm -hmm. to uh, one of the customers and it was brought to light uh, in the news and so we from our perspective by association with that particular vendor put us at risk from a reputation perspective so uh, having a good reputation for vendors are important for us because uh, we do not want to be um, impacted by association with uh, such uh, entities or uh, providers that have adverse media or are seen to be corrupt so um okay so maybe what we can do now is we can have a five minute break and then we'll come back and continue with the rest of the uh, session and um, maybe in the meantime, if anyone has any uh, questions or feedback, feel free to put in the chat or, um, or you have any questions at all. Five minutes, so we will be back my time at uh, 9.05. Any questions?
Okay, welcome back. I hope everyone is back from your break. Maybe give me a show of hands uh, if uh, or, or thumbs up for those of you who are back. Yay. All right, so let's uh, resume. And uh, Chinyap has a question. Do you think normally a country with high CPI may also reflect high money laundering activities? So, show of hands, um, or maybe, uh, maybe I throw this to the, maybe I throw this to all your participants. What are your thoughts? What do you think? Um, is there normally a higher risk of money laundering activities for uh, countries with high CPI? What do you think? Okay, uh, Chinyap raises her hand, so let me unmute. Yep. Can you unmute uh, yourself? I'm not able. Uh, Chinyap, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you put your hand up. Yep. Uh, okay. So, uh, back to the question. Yes, David. Uh, yeah. David says that uh, could be the more CPI might also be indicating a weaker AML control, so maybe less detection. Uh, yeah, potentially. So, I, I think um, if we... We look at those uh, customers that have a perceived higher, uh, uh, sit higher in the risk, uh, in the corruption perception index. Is that uh, potentially? And I think um, where I would say that it's not only about uh, higher risk of uh, money laundering control. Yeah, so uh, it, how it affects the overall risk is definitely uh, relevant. Uh, and so I think uh, the, the other concern is also where there is corruption, there would be a higher risk of a fraud happening as well. Or and say, for example, um, when there is a, is an, a corrupt bank officer, so it is very easy for a customer or potential customer to just say that, hey, I, I want a loan and here are the documents and I will give you a kickback uh, if you if you approve the loan, therefore uh, I will I will give you say a 10% kickback, right? One million means that the officer gets 10, 000, uh, 100,000. And so, uh, I mean, if it is a corrupt environment is where uh, there is a higher chance of uh, fraud, fraud as well. And when there's a higher chance of fraud being a predicate crime, there is definitely, uh, to me, um, it is kind of like a ripple effect. And it's a chain uh, reaction as well. When there's a higher chance of fraud, means that there's a higher chance of uh, being a predicate crime. There's definitely a higher chance of money laundering. And also, it could definitely be an indicative of a weaker AML control. And when you have weaker AML control, um, uh, this is not being detected. Again, it comes back to a spiral where even if it's being detected, is anyone doing anything about it? And worst of all, when you have, say, for example, a corrupt uh, environment, even if somebody wants us to uh, raise a, to whistleblow, how is that going to impact you? I think one of the things that is currently being um, uh, discussed a lot is around the risk of... Uh, being a whistleblower, uh, just in the case of the wire card, okay, Puff Gill has actually uh, come a long way since the day he, he whistle blew. And uh, I have actually met another lady who is also setting up an NGO for whistleblowing. And uh, where she was uh, deported from the UAE uh, for, uh, du during that time. And um, it, it was a, 
I think with Deutsche Bank. So, um, okay, what I I like to throw this to the group as well to give your thoughts on if you see an issue, um, what are the likelihood that you will whistleblow? And what are the concerns that you have if you were to whistleblow? Have you given any thought about that? What would be the consideration before you do whistleblow? I, I would start with um, my own thought as well is whether or not I would do it. Um, I think that I would say that it really depends on the state I'm at at that point in time. So I, I would like to also hear your thoughts uh, from the participants. Um, would you whistleblow? Like uh, in the case of Wirecard or in the case of uh, a few of the other organizations that have been in the news. Any what? What about the considerations? What are the considerations when you think uh, when you want to decide whether you want to whistleblow? Maybe I'll call someone, Norianti. Okay. Um. Yeah, Ricky, you're right. Uh, what it says in the whistleblow policy for protection when doing it. Um, I, I think that uh, while it says in the policy, yes. Yep, yep. Chinyap says to go back to the first three elements, whether the person involved has acted beyond authority and he or she has abused it for private gain. So it's looking at the fact of the matter, whether, uh, you know, the, uh, whether there was a really an, a, a corruption or an abuse of power in that instance um i i think that uh, it is also we i had this discussion with a group of our compliance officers only uh, last week about whistleblowing whether they would do it so here are some takes from them one is uh whether or not uh as ricky mentioned about the protection uh while it is in the policy sometimes a lot of people one is there could be a reason that uh, the awareness of it, whether the staff is really aware of the whistleblowing policy. The second one is how confident they are that they will be protected. Um, is that tone from the top in terms of uh, the whistleblowing policy? And the third one is uh, very, very real, is that what happens if I lose my job? Because uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, like, uh, in the case of the wire card whistleblower, it was a really, really painful. Um, it was a really painful time for him and even for his mother. And so, uh, when you do not have a an environment where there is a support system, uh, to encourage you to stay firm to your decision, it would probably the person would probably not do it. And especially if he has, uh, he's the sole breadwinner. You know, he or she is a sole breadwinner of the family. And he or she may be concerned about the lives uh, involved or he, he may he may feel his life is being threatened. He's still whistleblow. So this these are some of the real considerations as well. Um and uh, again back to whether the organization they have confidence in the organization protecting them. So uh well, I think uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, they are already being introduced uh, whistleblowing act. I think UK is one of them. Uh, I'm not really familiar with any of the others that are um, coming up. Uh, yes, whistleblowing is uh, the up and coming. And um, a lot of uh, companies also, while they have a whistleblowing policy, um, this this was uh, this was quite interesting because I drafted the whistleblowing policy um, for the, my company and uh, the staff 
ask me, so you have a whistleblowing policy. What if I want to want to whistleblow on you? Who do I whistleblow to? So the uh reporting structure is important. Uh, what if uh what if uh, I want to whistleblow on my CEO? I think uh, that I believe it will come to the compliance department and then after that, depending on how independent the compliance department is. So, and, and then uh, it would be to go to the board or the, does the person go directly to the regulators uh, for a regulated entity? Uh -huh. Where do we go to? So uh, in, in, in a lot of times, I believe uh, there are consulting firms out there who have set up a uh, outsourced whistleblowing uh, function where rather than to whistleblow to the compliance department internally or to whistleblow to risk function to whistleblow to the CEO as per the document uh, there is actually a very well set up uh, outsourced whistleblow function uh, in some com um, some uh, consulting firms uh, to uh, to offer that service so it, it actually takes away the uh, it actually enhances the independence of the function that is uh, taking the report in. So, uh, and I, I think uh, this is one level I feel that is, uh, it, it gives comfort that the whistleblower will not be implicated uh, internally. Uh, and then, uh, and of course, you know, it really depends on uh, how big the organization is as well as how complicated the structures are. And how confident the the people that the teams are or the staff are in terms of uh, the implementation of the whistleblowing policy. Yep. So when it comes to PEP, uh, it is important for us to identify whether or not you know there are PEPs involved in some of the organizations uh, whether or not uh, and and here i wanted to also emphasize again on the vendor risk assessment where uh, i think while we talk about the due diligence of the vendor it's not just as uh, it's just not as simple as uh, actually customer due diligence i personally felt that um, vendor risk assessment is more complicated as compared to customer due diligence because when it comes to customer due diligence you know it's just the um the five criteria that uh, and, and plus whether or not uh, this one, right? So when it comes to customer due diligence, we are looking at uh, whether or not uh, what kind of uh, customer it is, uh, industry risk, uh, jurisdiction, so on and so forth. When it comes to assessing a vendor, especially one that is going to be providing you your major infrastructure, say for example, uh, AWS, which is providing your cloud, cloud structure, uh, how do I assess the vendor? It is not as simple as just screening the the, the vendor names and the key controllers. It is not, but well, we know what the industry is. But it is it goes beyond that. It goes uh, into uh, assessing the technical as well. It's just like uh, when it comes to credit. And it even has to assess the credit whether or not, you know, that... Um, vendor that you are making use of actually has the financial backing if something were to happen and so um it is it is a definitely a way more complicated process uh, and and uh, and then the structure so um, uh, maybe also uh, getting a sense of uh, participants uh, in your organizations in your organizations and in any of your organizations that have a vendor risk management program, would you like to share uh, whether you have a vendor risk management program in the in the um, in your organizations? Any organizations here with vendor risk management program? And where does it sit? Does it sit with compliance or is there a particular uh, department? As uh, Chin Yap highlighted also, especially uh, in corruption, uh, in the government agencies would be on the procurement. Uh, there's a lot of uh, scrutiny to that is required in the procurement in any of these agencies.
Vicky, you had a you have a really good question there. NDA if NDAs are signed with this conflict with a low policy. So um I know that there in uh, I think recent in the recent news there have been a, a lot of talk about the NDAs that are being signed. Um anyone who would like to uh anyone has any thought about it? Um maybe I call on some of our more regular um, um, participants are Anthony, do you have any thought about the NDA versus the <laughs> whistleblowing uh, whistleblow policy? Yeah, yeah, Chin Yap, you mentioned about uh, your, your view is that the Corruption Act should. I think it's not May, but it should supersede uh, any of the NTAs that get signed. And um, in my personal view that, uh, in fact, if there is any NDA that is being signed, um, it really depends very much on the whistleblower policy, whether or not um, it gives that blanket that, you know, uh, it, it, no NDA or no documentation will supersede it. Um, I think, uh, I mean... I am pretty guilty of that when I designed the whistleblower policy. Never, the, the thought of um, NDA actually never crossed my mind. So um, being the one who wrote that policy, would I have actually included that uh, on hindsight? I possibly would have uh, included that as well. Um, Maybe not me, but I believe the senior management may want to include that clause that uh, to allow for NDAs to be signed. Because, you know, end of the day, uh, uh, I, th I think that uh, there, would po there could possibly be some form of clauses that say that uh, if any of these uh, were highlighted, this would not be... Um, this would not be disclosed to, and I think that the most important is that um, it would not be this, it would not be publicized. Um, I, it really depends on uh, situations as well. Uh, the whistleblowing policy. Thanks, David. Uh, and uh, the whistleblowing policy is, is after all, an internal document and it's really up to the senior management to uh, put in the clauses as well. Um, but yes, you're right, Chin Yap. I believe that uh, the Corruption Act in any jurisdiction would uh, supersede uh, any of these uh, requirements or any of this policy because these uh, are not if they are deemed to be uh, allowed, permitting a corruption to happen. Yep. Organizations must, must make known to the vendors about the ABC and uh, policy and whistleblower policy as well. And um, in fact, uh, a lot of companies do have their whistleblower policy in their website, uh, not just for the vendors, but also for the customers because it does give uh, comfort to the customers as well that they could also... Um, they, they also have the right to whistleblow or even uh, do complain uh, to the regulators. In fact, a lot of the customers do complain to the regulators. Uh, and I think in some uh, jurisdiction, you have uh, the uh, Complaints Bureau that has been set up by the government. And this is one of the agency where the customers can actually raise a complaint or even whistleblow on any entity or any um, regulated or financial institutions. So yes, um, when it comes to vendor risk management, it is really uh, can be quite challenging in terms of managing because you know there are big ones, small ones, and it is not homogeneous like how we manage customers. So each of the customer, each of the uh, vendor would have a different uh, kind of uh, because it depends on the product that we are purchasing. If you are purchasing uh stationery, how do you uh how do you review that versus if you're put, uh, you're granting out uh, large contracts so this uh this is why you know when it comes to uh, uh large contracts it's typically through tendering because that's where um it would be seen uh, to be a more fair process where uh, everyone is given the opportunity to tender anyone who is qualified
So we talked about the PEP part. And so some of the internal, um, so that's on uh, as far as um, ex assessing third party as in people that are outside of our organization. So when it comes to the, the interesting thing about anti-bribery and corruption, it is not just about the, uh, it is not just about the due diligence on the uh, external because there is always the, uh, the take and the give, right? So, uh, we talk about external party, which is the vendor uh, risk management procurement in particular. Then, uh, we and then we talk about that. That's on the bribery side, and the corruption side is where it gets a bit more challenging, and and uh, it is where uh our due diligence will be able. Um, we are hoping that our customer due diligence will be able to pick up. So okay, take a step back. So I think when it comes to anti-bribery and corruption, they are we can break that down into three parts. Customers. Are our customers are susceptible or um, of a higher risk in terms of bribery and corruption? Whether or not they are they are in a position of power to be able to accept corruption, uh, to be corrupt, uh, whether or not anyone would want to pay them to be corrupt, to make decisions that are disadvantages to others. So that is where, you know, our PEP assessment comes in. That's on the PEP, on, on the customer side. Then anti-bribery and corruption on the external party would be on the van our vendor risk management. The vendor risk management is where we want to ensure that one is on the reputation of the, of the organization or the vendor that we are onboarding to deal with us because Potentially, there would be a reputational risk if uh, we do not do a proper due diligence. This is the same for the com for our customers as well. So say, for example, Najib, uh, the previous prime minister of uh, Malaysia, uh, the, the financial institutions that were associated with him were obviously in deep trouble with fines and with adverse media and uh, the perception of all these entity, uh, these financial institutions have gone down as well. Uh, would I want to say, for example, be um, do I want to, as a correspondent bank, would I have concern with onboarding uh, M Bank at that time as a, a respondent? How comfortable and how confident I am with their uh, customer due diligence and their, and, and their internal policies as far as anti bribery and corruption are concerned? How confident am I that they have a proper due diligence done on PEPs? So this is on one side on the impact on any of these organizations that do not, uh, you know, are seen to not have a robust uh, customer due diligence on this area. And it's also very, uh, it's also an, an area of uh, significant concern. That's why in the Wolfsburg questionnaire for all the current Correspondent Banking Due Diligence Questionnaire has a section on anti-bribery and corruption. <laughs> All right, two. The second point is um, on the vendor side on uh, anti-bribery corruption. So this is where we need to have the policies and procedures in place to first assess the vendor and then also to ensure that internally um, we have, this is where it ties into the internal, internal part. Uh, on when we do any of the vendor risk assessment is that we also need to have um, a policy in place of gifts and entertainment or gifts and hospitality policy. So um, a lot of uh, banks now, they do have a minute where they the staff will be, um, it to requ will be required to declare uh, gifts or any of the hospitality that exceed a certain amount. And then also whether, and, and then, um, or maybe in certain instances to encourage staff to decline. And of course, you know, there are in, in, in our region, we would have uh, during the festive season, um, 
the, for the Chinese, we will have during Chinese New Year the Ang Pao, and during the uh, Eid or Raya, Hari Raya, Adi Fitri, there would be uh, the Duet Raya. So uh, there are instances where the customers would uh, be giving out all these uh, Ang Pao's or uh, in the form of money normally you know, and do it right here. And so it one one other thing is that it is cultural and therefore, you know, uh, if we were to not accept these gifts, um it would be deemed as an offense to the person who is giving as well. And so therefore, you know, in, in very many it's a tradition we typically will accept that. Now then it comes a cha a, a challenge. When we accept these gifts, um the, the important here is that we would, we want the staff to also disclose, not because it is a tick box exercise, but also it is a form of protection for the staff. Implementing this uh, gifts and hospitality policy and the procedures has never been easy because, you know, the training uh, for the staff is always very important to give. One is to give awareness that um, why this is so important. It is not just about just declaration and it's just not about the controls, but it's also about allowing the staff to say, hey, you know, I actually received this money. And then and then the declaration is to protect the staff as well. And I, I hope that this is something that we, it can be shared across the all organizations is that the control here is also as a form of protection to the staff is that I, I have made a declaration that uh, this is, uh, I have received this Ang Pao. And uh, some, in, in some um, departments that I have seen is actually where it, it when the, such gifts or Ang Pao is given, or sometimes hampers are given, um, usually we would distribute it and, and put it as a, in, into our team pantry and say, hey guys, you know, we just received uh, this uh, hamper or this from the, from our vendor or from our customers and feel free to take the goodies uh, yourself uh, is in the pantry. So it is a very common practice because what we we don't want to be to do is that whoever who is the recipient of such gifts to be obliged to um, do favors for the person who who has given the gifts. So one is on the declaration and the other one is uh, whatever that is deemed um, what is seen as um, it really depends on the person who is receiving. Is that uh, a, a lot of times we do not impose it on the recipient that you have got to distribute it. But the first thing is uh, to ensure that this is being uh, recorded, this is being declared, so that we will not be in any way compromised in future. So say, for example, a vendor or a customer may come, come back one day to say, you know, uh, I gave so-and-so a huge hamper worth $1,000. And, you know, I was expecting him to do more for me. And uh, then the person can say, well, um, can at least, uh, if there was such a complaint that comes in, uh, it is already on record that he has already made the declaration and uh, what he has done with it. And uh, this is uh, another good practice is that no gifts should be received or given uh, more than three times a year. And I know that uh, it, when it comes to hospitality as well, um, in the past, um, a lot of financial institutions are quite used to uh, giving F1 tickets to uh, public officials especially. And now uh, offering uh, gifts and hospitality to public officials are already prohibited. Um, this, the definition of public official um, is rather general. It really depends on how this is being uh, defined in the policy of any organization or any jurisdiction. In some jurisdictions, public officials are clearly defined uh, and typically they are uh, they 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 would hold the same uh pro they would hold the same uh prominence as the peps uh these are the ones that we would not be um 
receiving uh, we will not be offering gifts and hospitality to and so uh and also you know in a broader say for example an event where um, a financial institution is uh sponsoring again for example an f1 race where uh, the financial institution is a sponsor so if there is any um if there is any plan to offer any tickets uh, it is or it all has to be well documented it all has to be well justified and also um, the entire governance process of um, of a declaration and approval has to be followed because uh and because this is extremely important and and also in some uh, financial institutions it's also highlighted that if such an F, if the f1 ticket as an example, an F1 ticket is given to the public official. It's only for the public official and it doesn't include partner. And if any hospitality or any or form of uh, meals or whatever that is being offered, it is only to that person and not to the partner. So th these are some of the areas that um, have come to, uh, ha has been implemented since uh, the UK Bribery Act came into place uh, sometime in 2010. So far, so good. Any comments or any? Yes. Yeah, Anthony, yeah, you're right. So government officials definition, not necessarily as PEP. It can include the uh, junior position as uh, seen in the US F FCPA. So, and, and, and this is particular, uh, particularly so for those uh, companies that are that are bound by the US uh, FCPA, uh, the Foreign Corruption Practice Act. Yep. So uh, this is on the internal part of gifts and hospitality policy. Do you, any of your organizations, uh, maybe a show of hands, which uh, you have in your organization, a gifts and entertainment or gifts and hospitality policy? Show of hands. Yep, yep, yep. Banks would have that. Um, and a lot, uh, I think a lot of organizations, government organizations as well would have that. Uh, the gifts and entertainment policy. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. And I believe a lot of organizations now would have a gifts and entertainment policy. And, um, if anyone, any anyone here who has uh, had the opportunity of uh, implementing one, uh, say for example, a gifts and entertainment register and been involved in training, I would like to understand your experience in um, in uh, the implementation process, uh, whether or not you have received the training or you have been the one conducting the training. Any experience to share? No one? Yep, so um, I, I think that uh, this is an ongoing process uh, as far as uh, the gifts and the entertainment policy is concerned that, you know, uh, normally in a lot of organizations, there will be a uh, annual training requirement, accreditation, or, or um, attestation requirement as well that they have uh, read the policy, they have undergone the training, and, and so on and so forth. So, again, uh, back to uh, conflict of interest. So, this is, again, uh, different from the uh, gifts and entertainment and all that. So, there are different types of conflict of interest. So, it could be a direct conflict, it could be a conflict that might uh, arise in future. It is a conflict that appears or reasonable to believe may exist, like in the case of um, the, uh, the MP who was appointed to grab. Although um, she may not 
and be actually um, in a function that has conflict of interest in, to the public eye because she's a minute, uh, she's a member of parliament um, it was still seen as a not really acceptable yes in Malaysia um, the organization under the adequate procedure needs to prove that they are implementing the policies and procedures yep um, hmm. Not just putting on the shelf. Uh, yes, I, I think that uh, this, I agree with that totally. And, uh, you know, when it comes to anti-bribery and corruption, which is more and more coming into the front, um, there has been a lot more emphasis on customer due diligence and anti-money laundering in the past. And, um, and anti-bribery and corruption has not really uh, received the attention that it deserved. So and and so now there is a lot of uh, happening from the authorities and in fact you know you can see that even in Vietnam corruption can uh, attract a death penalty. So uh, that that's uh, the kind of uh, that the kind of attention that has now been uh, starting to be placed on anti-bribery and corruption. I mean I remember the first uh, the first version of the Wolfsburg question, uh, uh, correspondent banking due diligence questionnaire, there were less questions or there was probably just a one-liner to say, do you have an anti-bribery and corruption policy in place in your organization? That was a single liner. And then now it's actually gone into way uh, deeper and as far as anti-bribery and corruption is concerned. So it shows... Um, how important this topic is and, and it is an area where uh, it is the least understood and also uh, with, um, uh, most difficult to implement because uh, while on the external side, it is very easy for us to uh, do the name screening, to look at PEP, to look at uh, potential um, uh, potential uh, conflict of interest that's on the external part and there's adverse media and all but when it comes to anything that is from the internal perspective it's rather difficult so on conflict of interest especially so in, in fact uh, I was uh, having this conversation because um, I got invited to be a judge for an award and um, I I made it very clear that there are certain categories I will have got to recuse myself because a few of the uh, participants or the people who submitted uh, their nominations for the award are known to me and so a, I actually had to recuse myself from a full category of the award and so because uh, what first is uh, not so much about um, it may I mean reasonable it is reasonable to believe that there may be conflict involved as well and also from a personal perspective I decided to recuse myself is that I do not want to be in a position to uh, have to answer to anybody that say hey you knew me why did you not choose me or why did you not vote for me so this is something that um that from a personal perspective, I do not, I, I don't want to uh, face, and this is just the same with receiving uh, a anyone who receives a hamper or angpao and all that to also declare it so that and and uh, in some cases uh, they distribute it because they do not want it and they made it very clear to the giver as well that thank you very much this is going to go to the team you know they really enjoy um, the gifts that you gave because. Um, the most important is that we do not want to be put in a position where we are obliged to the giver in future. So uh, that that's where the potential conflict that might uh, happen in future because um, that, that's what uh, a lot of us would not want to uh, face as well. And so some uh, the other thing is about the example of, uh, of policy. Uh, 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 Okay, this, this is an area where um, I have also uh, been quite involved in uh, in recent years is where especially uh, a lot of us um, in this time, uh, we do have uh, a lot of uh, outside business interests. You know, we have this gig economy that is going on. So while we are in a full-time role, uh, some organizations are also fine with... Uh, 
having uh, outside business interest as long as it is declared. And of course, you know, the guideline typically as sample is that it does not create any actual or potential conflict of interest. Say, for example, if I am in uh, I am in the bank working in a compliance department, would I be actually uh, doing uh, compliance advisory work for an external party that is outside the bank, right? that would be a potential conflict of interest. And it's definitely a conflict of interest if uh, the person is actually a client of the bank. Um, and also, uh, of course, it is important that uh, the employee does not have, it does not have, uh, it doesn't affect the employee's ability to discharge a duty during office hours. And uh, say uh, the, per the employee doesn't go out at uh, four o'clock uh, because uh, he has another job that he needs to go to. And I, I do know that there are a lot of our staff um, when we were working, I was working in a fintech where, or a startup really, uh, where uh, I have a, one of my team members who is actually a bartender uh, after work. And then I have another staff who plays in a band. And so they do dis declare their outside business interests so that this is not uh this will not there will not be a conflict of interest as well and um we actually had a staff um this was also to protect the staff and good thing that she uh she declared her outside business interest she was in she had a business of uh selling fabric and um some one one of the stakeholders uh reported and complained about her selling her having an outside business interest. And the good thing is because um, this was already declared and therefore, you know, uh, if she had not declared that she had an outside business interest and when someone complains, it may uh, it may attract a full-blown investigation into why she did not declare the outside business interest, but she did. And so, you know, this actually protected her when a stakeholder uh, lodged a complaint against her uh, for for having an outside business interest. Um, and of course, importantly, is that when they are doing the outside business, is that they do not use the company's name. They do not be, uh, they do not uh, represent the company in uh, in the other activity that they are at. So say, uh, especially, uh, and th then this is very important because, you know, whatever that uh, is uh, on the other side, outside of the company uh, activities uh, should anything were to uh, should any adverse media were to come uh, let the company's name not be dragged into the waters so of course there are exceptions to it um, you know where there are internal uh, directorship uh, member of the industry committee uh, professional organization and all that um, say for example I could be uh, conducting training for inter international compliance association um, as a trainer, so uh, these are some of the activities, and, and this is not as an advisor to, and it's not an advisory uh, uh, or contract. So, did, so that uh, I mean, in, in any case, this was also uh, declared as outside business interest. Yeah, and so uh, staff, uh, Chin Yang also highlighted that staff may seek a HR approval or the department charge or ABC if they are not sure. Um, I think it really depends on the organization and the size of the organization. Um, there are, in in some organizations, this is actually not under HR, but under compliance. So, uh, and it's not in the financial crime compliance department, but it is in the regulatory compliance. You know, in a compliance umbrella, uh, there is a, there are generally two parts. One is on the regulatory compliance or one is on the financial crime compliance. One is on the comp financial crime compliance, I'll say. And the other one is anything that doesn't fall into financial crime compliance will fall into the other part. Uh, general compliance, regulatory compliance, whatever uh, you, you may you may call the team. And so uh, there are some institutions that I'm aware of that actually have this ABC part under compliance. And in fact, uh, whistleblowing was part under compliance as well. So uh, really depends on the uh, structure depends on the organization and the size of the organization and uh, and who who has been assigned to it um, so uh, and then yep the ownership interest and and this is an area where um, 
any regulators are quite particular about is where there, if there is ownership interest, say, especially where the directors as well as the uh, beneficial owners of a particular regulated entity, whether or not they hold any uh, active position in another um, financial institution. So or, or it could be, say, for example, a, a, a director or, a, or uh, any of the employee in a bank that actually holds an interest in, say, for example, a money service, service bureau, or in a financial advisory firm, or in a in a stockbroking firm. So these these are the kind of uh, concerns that we have. So uh, on that also, I wanted to bring uh, forward. Uh, uh, I think in a lot of jurisdiction, there is also the fit and proper guidelines. Uh, that any of the senior management role are fit and proper. Uh, and this includes actually having a good credit uh, status, in, or, or they they are not uh, char the charge judge bankrupt and 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 all that because uh being fit and proper for any uh, senior role especially in the financial institution is extremely important because we do not uh we do not want to um, have exposure to any particular individual in the senior management or decision making role that may potentially compromise their integrity because of a financial pressure uh, that they are facing personally. And uh, again, it back it comes back to um, there being a temptation because if they are put in a position where they are under pressure, it may happen. I'm not saying that it will happen, but uh, we do not want to put anyone into a position where they could be tempted. Yes, it, it, it does uh, It does not cover only staff, and, but also their associates. And also, I think on the conflict of interest side, um, especially in a more sensitive uh, trading department, I think, Chin Yap, you are very familiar with uh, the trading uh, environment is where, uh, and especially in the dealing room, if there are any, or, or treasury where um, staff are not allowed to trade in, uh, Custom in shares of customers uh, that they are working on uh, because uh, for fear of uh, insider trading, and in terms of corruption, there are a lot of a uh, a lot of areas to think about, especially when it comes to um, insider trading. For example, if I knew some information and I sell it to a third party, uh, so that they can make money, uh, money, uh, basically market sensitive information, and, and this is an area of concern as well. That's why uh, the trading room. Uh, uh, the trading floor phones are recorded and so that you know that the, this is also a form of protection of the traders so um and and and, and all that kind of uh, activities uh so in when it comes it's really uh, on conflict of interest it is really uh it is really very interesting topic it's really vast it's really wide uh it covers a lot of areas yeah say uh like Chinyap mentioned uh, uh, this uh the, the husband was not allowed to work in a bank related to a department in treasury because she was in Bank Nagara. <laughs> bank Nagara is the central bank of Malaysia. So, uh, yeah, so it is it is that uh, sensitive when it comes to... So now we are talking about not just outside business interests, but also actually impacting some uh, uh, an associate of a person who is working in a sensitive role. So on whistleblowing, yeah, Anthony says that uh, organizations must put in place vigorous policies and procedures and a strong culture. So it comes back to tone, tone from the top and compliance culture. There are a lot of things that, you know, uh, checklists will not be able to, uh, checklists will not be able to stop. It is up to us and our organizations to inculcate that kind of culture where people would want to do the right thing. Well, sometimes it seems like, um, you know, it's just a bit of money, but look at the impact that it could cause. Um, the, the insider trading, it could actually cause a, a share, the shares of a company to collapse, right? So, so and, and it's going to impact the entire market. It's going to impact the innocent people who actually purchase those shares. So, um, and uh, yep, that that is also part of uh, I mean, or, although uh, we did not specifically talk about insider trading, but a lot of all these uh, activities are also connected with corruption. Yep, 
the yeah, Chin Yap mentioned about the CC person because we can look at the interpretation of the Transparency International where we mentioned about the private gain. Private gain and not just personal gain. Yep, so internally, I think uh, this is where uh, we want to talk about um, knowing our responsibilities and um, and we need to continue to um, train our staff to remind them about their obligation as well to report. And the hiring decisions. This, this is something that, uh, that uh, even for... Uh, Internships uh, in the UK Bribery Act also it was highlighted uh, on especially on the hiring decision that uh, we cannot hire it. Um, you know we have to be very even if hiring intern or anybody it has to go through the due hiring process and not just through connection. It used to be the case where I hire you because I know you, especially if I mean. Uh, especially so the the rules have become stricter in uh, regulated entities because you know uh, of, of this particular reason and conflict of interest declaration form this is a sample of what it looks like uh, in a lot of organizations there will be a form some of them will be shorter some of them will be longer but basically the con uh, conflict of interest declaration here uh, just now I didn't uh, I, I didn't flesh it out on the screen um, and one of the area of conflict of interest is also relations whether or not there is a relationship between one party to another we have actually seen in organizations where when colleagues became couples uh, they made declaration to HR so that this is being taken care of as well, uh, that they declared that they are uh, they they potentially would have a conflict of interest, especially when they are in the same department. And uh, in a lot of instances for larger organizations, uh, the couples would uh, would then be reassigned to different departments so that they are not in positions where they could expose the them, themselves to potential conflict of interest. And this is also a form of protection, not just for the company, but also for the individuals involved. And uh, this is a sample of a gifts and entertainment declaration form um, that uh, I implemented in the past. So uh, with that, um, actually, uh, we also talk about the political and charitable contribution and sponsorship that we need to have the appropriate level of due diligence being done and to um, seek approval from the senior management. It's uh, the same, uh, whether or not it's political, it, it is for charitable or is for sponsorship. So um, it's very important that we are mindful of, especially in our organizations. Um, and I believe there are a few of the uh, uh, government organizations here as well. And uh, to also um, be aware of this. And yes, Anthony, you're right. The conflict of interest may result in collusion and breaking of the segregation of control. That's why it is important for us to uh, to manage the risk of collusion. Uh, that's why, and, and also important for the declaration to be made. And so here we have uh, from uh, our pre preliminary survey, these are some of the uh, top questions or concerns that have been addressed. And I think and, uh, the correspondent banking due diligence uh, need to factor in more on the virtual review and understanding the proper application of the SWIFT messages. So this was also something that I highlighted earlier in our central bank, uh, the case with the central bank of Angola, where um, especially in the banks, uh, we need to understand the implications of the SWIFT messages. And of course, now we have the ISO standards that have come in. Um, the information that is in those messages are also important to also look at the uh, the originator and beneficiary information. And if that's not put in place, this is where we are not able to identify. Say, for example, in that case of the um, MT202, which is for interbank transfers, but there was actually a non-bank as a recipient uh, and recipient of the funds, this was not picked up earlier. And so therefore, you know, in especially in the payments department, having a good understanding of the SWIFT messages is extremely important. Yep, yeah. Shinyap also mentioned about the implementing the job rotation among the staff. Yep. 
especially in the top uh, in in the control roles uh, it is important to have uh, one is on the uh, one is on the staff rotation the other one is on block leave as we call it you know um, where you have mandate leave of a minimum of two mark two weeks so that there's somebody else who's coming in to take over to uh, do the your role and these are uh, this is the time uh, this is part of the internal control that is also imposed uh, for all banks uh, regulated entities that there would be all this mandate um, mandatory leave that is uh, put in place because uh, this is actually where uh, in, in fact I, I can share uh, about an incident where we had a trade finance uh, manager that was in his role for a long time and uh, people were I mean he was very very dependent and in fact during those days um, although it was already in the policy but it was not implemented was the mandatory leave and when there was a new head of trade finance came in he dis he imposed that he, he implemented that policy and forced the officer to go on leave and during the two weeks he was on leave uh, we had to break open his locker because there were a lot of evidence in there that he has actually been uh, he has actually been uh, siphoning money out from the bank uh, making use of bankers checks um, sign because he was the signatory to the banker's check and he is actually making use of um, the banker's check to make payment to his personal credit card accounts and this was only identified after seven years of him doing it because uh, because there was so much trust in the officer that no one actually thought that he would do it but with a new uh, head of department who implemented this rule about the mandatory leave um, what he did for the past seven years was uh, was found was identified. So um, so all these uh, controls that are put in place not for fun, but for a reason of internal control. And then um, yeah, exactly. What is the comfort level? Uh, someone actually asked this question. Where even though there are policies and procedures, what are the comfort level that they are abiding by? And uh, of course, this is where. Um, this is where we are looking at uh, having assurance and aud audit testing in place. And in, yeah, I, and I hope that, you know, this um, is slowly being uh, answered. This question is our quest to find a solution for the correspondent banking relationship problem and the complexity. Uh, we are hoping that um, the webinar that we have conducted in the past six and next week will be the last one is if we are able to break them down into actionable steps for the Pacific Island countries. And I hope this is uh, really uh, helping. And again, back to um, if anyone has any further burning questions, we have last session next week to raise those points. Please uh, share them. So uh, if you have any uh, concern, so that we can uh, address any of the areas that have not been addressed uh, in, in, in our next and the last session uh, of the webinar. And with that, uh, this, this I'm sharing you, with you again the, um, the link uh, to the Slido if you have any question for us to address in next session. And here are the resources. And with that, thank you very much, any, everyone, for attending today's session. And I hope that this has been helpful. Thank you, as usual, uh, to uh, those who contributed to the discussion. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for attending. <laughs>